All right, here we go. Today we have journalist George Sheedy, uh, who writes for the Atlanta Objective and also has a show on Fox 5 in Atlanta called The Next Atlanta, which has been nominated for an Emmy. Uh, George, today you're going to talk about the Young Thug and YSL RICO case, a case you've actually been following for the past year. Welcome to Vlad TV. Happy to be here. Good to talk about this. Okay. And you're really a uh, a veteran uh, investigative journalist. Uh, you got your MBA from Georgia Tech, and you also have a journalism degree from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Correct. It's funny, you call me an investigative journalist. I believe that there's just journalism. Like, if you're if you're a journalist, you're investigating. If you're not investigating, what are you doing? <laughs> there you go. There you go. Okay, and you actually started following the story about a year ago. So, you know, I went through the, the paperwork, which is uh, the 88-page indictment, very closely. And that really set up a whole timeline in terms of everything that's happening. And I just want to note that at this point, everyone is innocent until proven guilty. Uh, these are just charges. So until there's either plea deals or there's court cases, we don't really know what's going to happen yet. I agree. These are allegations. Like, the police and the district attorney are saying they've got evidence X, Y, and Z. We haven't actually seen it yet. Correct. Correct. Okay. So I want to start in the very beginning. So uh, based on the paperwork, uh, they're saying that Young Thug is a founder of Young Slime Life. Uh, and they say it's, you know, as well as a record label and a crew, uh, the indictment actually says that it's a street gang that's affiliated with the Bloods that started in 2012. That's correct. At least that's what the police are saying. And I think that a huge part of this case is going to be distinguishing what is YSL, the music label, from YSL, the street gang. Um, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that the street gang is real, that it has existed, that it may have existed to some degree before any of this musical stuff was going on or, or in parallel to it. Uh, that it's an outgrowth of gang activity from South Atlanta that predated all of this stuff. Predated Young Thug, I might add. Um, but, I mean, plainly, there's an incorporated, there's a company called, like, Young Stoner Life that's incorporated in Georgia. Like, and there's nothing illegal about being a musician in Georgia with a music label. Um, it's it's going to be an interesting trial like showing the separation. Okay. And I mean, according to the paperwork, they're saying in 2013, that's when they first started investigating? So my strong suspicion is that they've been investigating the things that they are now associating with YSL from far before that even. Um, they, uh, they've they been looking at Young Thug probably since 2010, when he was a juvenile. Not necessarily in like in the context of YSL as a street gang, but in terms of Young Thug as somebody we might have to arrest in a serious way sometime. Okay. And at what point did the wiretaps start and so forth? So that's interesting. So the indictment alleges that Jeffrey Williams, Young Thug, rented a car that was used in a drive-by that killed a, a gang leader, Donovan Thomas. We called him Peanut. He was an Inglewood Blood gang member, uh, OG guy. Um, and it set off this war between YSL and YFN. A couple of weeks after that hit, it, at least according to the indictment, Jeffrey Williams spoke to a fellow who was in, he had to be in jail. Um, who was a, a leading uh, member of Sex Money Murder, which is a street gang that's based out of New York. Uh, he was apparently like the, the Georgia head of this, this gang. The only way Young Thug could have been talking to him was if that guy was in jail, which means they were tapping a phone or, or they were tapping a room where he went down there himself. It's not clear. I, I strongly suspect it was a phone call. Um, that implies that they were either following Young Thug around and knew to tap Young Thug's phone, or they were tapping this other guy's phone in jail. Um, and there's an outtake from that phone tap that where Thug is basically talking about, 
how, uh, you know, sometimes sacrifices have to be made. We don't know the full context for that conversation. We don't know if, even if they, that phone was tapped or whether or not that's an inside informant who's saying that. It looks like a tap, but I can't tell. A couple of days later, thugs on social media talking about how people who testify in court should be killed. And the implication is Donovan Thomas was killed because he was some sort of government informant. Okay, was that established that he was an informant? No. Like, that's something that we're looking for in the trial. That's the first time I've ever heard that. It explains a hell of a lot, but it's the first time anybody had heard that outside of a courtroom. Okay. And this is all happening in 2015. That's all 2015. Right. And I looked all this up. So they're saying that Young Thug allegedly rented a silver Infinity Q50 sedan. And a murder happened in connection with that car, allegedly. That's what they're saying. Uh, five men are charged with the murder uh, in connection with Donovan uh, Nut Thomas. Um, one of them is uh, Diomante Kendrick, identified as Yak Gotti. You know, I didn't know his real name before this indictment came out. I couldn't find it anywhere. It's right. Yak Gotti, Yak Gotti's a rapper, um, and his story kind of ties into to wife and Lucy later on, which we're, we're going to get to. Uh, but basically they're saying the indictment claims that after the killing of Mr. Thomas, the rival gang leader, Mr. Williams, AKA young thug appeared in a video, which he say to some people get killed, bro, for me in, in YSL. Um, and then, like you said, um, there was a, uh, a video that was released on social media. He said, so N words lie to their mama, lie to their kids, lie to their brothers and sisters, then get right into the courtroom and tell the God's honest truth. Don't get it. Y'all N words need to get fucking killed, bro, from me and YSL. And the feds are saying, well, I mean, the police, the state police are saying this is an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot here. Like this indictment, this indictment is 180 something. It's not 180 counts, but there are 180 pieces of evidence that they suggest that they are going to present at trial in the indictment. There's a lot here. There's a lot here that isn't in this indictment that I was expecting there to be, um, particularly certain lyrics from some songs. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't think we are privy to all of the evidence that's going to be introduced in trial. And more to the point, I, I think some of this stuff is likely to get thrown out. It depends. Right. Well, that same year in 2015, uh, Young Thug and Lil Wayne were kind of going at it a little bit. And then the shooting happened on the tour bus, uh, on Lil Wayne's tour bus. Lil Wayne was a victim in that particular situation, uh, even though he himself wasn't shot. Uh, but ultimately, the person who did the shooting was a guy named Jimmy Winfrey, who is a YSL member. Who has also been punished for this crime, I might add. Like he did time okay, for it already. So how much time did he get? I don't recall. Um, I, I think he may actually still be in prison. I have to check. Um, the, uh, I mean, it's interesting that there's, and that's more. There are more than one elements of this case where people are already in prison for the crimes that are associated with, with the indictment. What they're saying is, okay, you did this crime. Here's the punishment for that crime. But that crime was also in furtherance of a gang. And so there's potentially an extra five to 15 years that we're going to tack onto that sentence now. Like, get ready. Okay. So then, you know, you go through the indictment. Uh, there was some stuff in 2016 about various lyrics and so forth. I mean, they're basically taking, they're going through a fine, you know, fine tooth and comb through every Young Thug song and, and anything that sounds gang related, they're pretty much throwing everything in. It's almost like the kitchen sink is just being thrown into this indictment. Some of it, like the, uh, I think they've picked, uh, I think they've picked a few things that they knew that the grand jury would go, okay, we'll buy that. Um, I actually think there are more things that are, have more probative value that in other lyrics than the ones that they put in there. And I think some of the stuff that they've put in there around lyrics is trash as far as evidence is concerned it's probably going to get thrown out um there's going to be a huge argument perhaps a 
precedent-setting argument over what is and is not admissible in court over this sort of thing. Um, for example, there is one song that Thug does where he talks about uh, he's name-checking the various gangs he's belonged to. And he starts with YTC, then goes to ROB. That's raised on Cleveland, not Cleveland. Every, folks in Cle Cleveland Avenue here call it Cleveland because the B and the C for Bloods and Crips. Um, raised on Cleveland, then Sex Money Murder or SMM, then YSL. Like he's sort of showing the timeline himself in a line of lyrics. And when, now that alone, there's nothing illegal about referencing gang stuff in a song on its own. But in the context of a wiretap where you're talking to a gang leader from, you know, Sex Money Murder, and then you've got a song that's name checking Sex Money Murder, the two complement each other. Like the song itself, not illegal. The conversation might not be illegal, but those two things plus other evidence add up to this thing that you might get convicted for. Okay. And then in 2017, uh, there was a situation. So they're saying that, that Gunner and Young Thug uh, committed a felony offense by receiving stolen property uh, with a firearm. And the property was from a guy named Trayvon Lewis. Um, and it was about a stolen gun or something like that? Uh, that's what it looks like. Um, I don't know much about that specific event. Um, I actually went looking for it. I'm just like, it's just one more thing to dig at this point. Um, Ghana's charges are not violent. Like, I mean, that's something that's leaping out at me as a journalist. Um, a lot of what I'm looking at there is Gunna being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, he's in a car. There are a bunch of drugs. You get charged with drug trafficking because you are, quote, in possession because it's constructive possession. You're Right. Because in that same – I don't know if that's the same actual situation or whether it's broken up. But essentially in that same year, uh, they're saying that young, Gun, that young thug and Gunner – also committed a felony offense of possession of methamphetamine, hydroco hydrocodone, uh, and marijuana with intent to distribute, which is which is a little weird because, you know, it doesn't seem like these guys would be drug dealers in 2017. That might have been the thing where they got arrested coming off the plane um, in uh, DeKalb County at the municipal airport. Um, again, I need to check on that. Uh, the uh, but I mean, the clear thing for me is Gunn is not accused of shooting anybody or arranging for anybody to get shot or beating somebody up or an armed robbery or any of the other things that I would consider a violent, dangerous offense. And some of his lyrics are in the indictment, but okay, honestly, of all of them, I think he is the one. He's the most high-profile person I think is likely to walk away from this, like, as a young person with a life in front of them. Okay. Because then in 2018, the next year, uh, Gunner and Young Thug uh, had a traffic stop for speeding. Um, and after they went through the car, there was four individuals, and they found numerous weapons uh, with high capacity magazines, including AK 47 with 30 round clip. Yeah. Yeah. It's problematic. I, I honestly think that's, that's less problematic than the switch that they found in at young thugs house when they went yeah. to go arrest him a few days ago. But yes, here's the thing. I, we live in Georgia. Um, the kind of guns that people have in this state that are perfectly legal uh, would shock the conscience if you lived in, in New York or Philadelphia or Chicago. Um, the One of the things that the police are going to have to prove is whether or not those guns were illegally possessed. Okay. And then in that same year in 2018, and this is in the indictment, they're, they're trying to use these lyrics against them. Uh, you know, there was a social media post called Anybody 
uh, and it stated, uh, I never killed anybody, but got something to do with the body. I told them, shoot 100 rounds, ready for war like I'm Russia. I got all types of cash. Yeah. And and they're trying to, to use that lyric, I guess, in connection with the, the murder of Nutt uh, from a few years before that. Uh, they're going to try. Like, and I, I know I sound skeptical. Like, I think the preponderance of the evidence, the the weight of it all is going to be something. This is why we have juries. Juries are going to look at that and they're going to have to be walked through it. But ultimately, a jury is going to have to say, was this about that or was this art? Um, yeah. That's going to be a hard call. Okay. And then in 2019... You know, once again, in the paperwork, Young Thug posted an IG post and it said, why, if I didn't like what you did for your mother and kids, I would have been killed you. Yeah. That speaks to the gang war. Like this back and forth. Lucci, and I know you've had Lucci on your show, like why, if yeah. Lucci, who's in a right. jail cell right now on a felony murder charge. Uh, Lucci's mother's house got shot up twice. Like, with this feud that was going on between him and Young Thug, uh, they would sort of snap at each other, you know, or they would make weird comments about each other's family on social media. Um, some of that ties back to wife and Lucci essentially saying that he had slept with the girlfriend of Young Thug at one point. Um, it just set off this chain of events that led to violence, frankly. Okay, so then in 2020, uh, there was a song uh, that Young Thug put out on the YSL compilation, Slime Language 2. Uh, it was called Take It to Trial. Uh, the song had Young Thug, Gunna, and Yak Gotti. And Yak, Yak Gotti had a line, from my slimes, you know I'll kill. And once again, this ends up in the paperwork. Okay, so then we go to 2021. So there ends up being a young thug wiretap. And I think this is when it happens. I'm not quite sure about the date, but he said in the wiretap, y'all ain't beat him up or shoot him yet. Y'all boys getting soft. When did that happen exactly? Am I right on the date or no? I think you are. I think that was 2021. Yeah. Um, and it's like, I'm not sure that's a wiretap. Like, it might be, but I'm, it's not clear. Uh, the, uh, the, the point of putting that in there for the prosecution is to say that Young Thug was directing criminal activity and that this group was engaged in group criminal activity as a way to build their gang as a gang, as a unit. Um, that it wasn't just individual people committing crimes for whatever reason, but that the reason was we're a gang and we're committing gang crimes. Um, so that, that wiretap, that statement is there in order to, to, uh, facilitate that argument. Like, uh, there's a lot about the Georgia gang law that this gang terrorism act that goes into why this prosecution, this indictment is, is structured the way that it is. And when you understand how that law works, you'll understand why they're looking for evidence like this and this, why they're pulling Instagram stuff over here and lyrics over here and photographs of this, that, or the other thing over here. Okay. So then in April 2021, uh, the DA charged a dozen people uh, who are said to be members of gangs uh, that were, you know, basically in this gang war. Right. Um, one of which was... YFN Lucci. So he gets locked up and charged with a uh, felony murder? Felony murder. Okay. Um, and it's it's important. It's He's not accused of actually shooting someone. Um, he's accused of being the driver in a drive-by where they were shooting at other people. And the fellow who was sitting next to him who was shooting at the other people was killed by return fire. But because he was killed in an act that was a criminal, like his death is a murder and Lucci eats the felony murder charge as a result. Got it. Got it. Uh, okay. So now YFN Lucci is in jail in Atlanta 
But there's other people in jail as well. And some of those guys are YSL associates, allegedly. And in the indictment, uh, they said that uh, uh, Marquavis Huey. Yeah, Marquavius, I think. Marquavius Huey, Tenquarius Mender. Nard, yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. And Young Thug uh, basically had a recorded video while he was an inmate, while, while uh, T- Tinquarius was an inmate. And they were saying that the whole thing was recorded. Uh, you know, so during the call, uh, Mender said that he needed something. Uh, Young Thug pointed to Huey to take care of it and flashed the, the Mender the YSL sign and over it act of furtherance of the conspiracy. So basically, they said on on November 14th, uh, 2021, defendants Marquavius Huey and Jeffrey Williams, a.k.a. Young Thug, associates of YSL, were communicating when Huey stated, you know, I'm ready to handle the business and go sit down if I got to about any one of y'all on my mama. Which I guess they're saying I'm ready to to do whatever and then go to prison. uh, If it's about, you know, if it has to do with any of my, you know, my guys. You know, on my mom, I mean, like, yo, on my mom, I'm ready to do it. It's interesting, like, Tinquarius uh, Mender, Nard, that's his nickname, uh, in the other indictment, the YS, not the YFN indictment, like, there are notes in there how other inmates at Fulton County were threatening Nard, like, saying that you're a snitch and we're going to kill you. Like, and it looks like Nard had had some connection, like, cross- Cross the lines between these two uh, these two warring gangs. Um, it's not surprising to me that he would be reaffirming his fidelity to YSL, since I, frankly I think that might be what's protecting him in jail right now. Okay, so why Fan Lucci ends up getting stabbed in prison, but he survives. Correct. Did they find out who did it? or? Oh, no, they know a- exactly who did it. They, there's another inmate. Uh, he's been charged with an assault and breaking the rules and having a, sh- a shank. How he got stabbed is interesting. Um, a prison, a jail guard accidentally released two doors at once. And the other guy saw that Lucci was free, for lack of a better word. Like that he was in the hallway unguarded and went after him. It's not clear that that other guy, because I don't see that other guy in the indictment. Now, maybe he's there and maybe he's not, and I missed it, but I don't see that other guy in the indictment. Like the one who, like there's a, no, I take that back. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm wrong. I just, it just saw it just as I was talking about it. Like there's an element in the indictment that does name the guy that stabbed him. There are two people who are named in the indictment with regard to stabbing Lucci. Like, and you've got it in front of you, so you can see it. Right, um, right. Because what happened later on, there was uh, these two defendants, Christian Eppinger yeah. and Antonio Sumlin. Yes. Who they claim are associates of YSL, uh, committed the felony offense of conspiracy to commit murder by discussing how to obtain the permission of Slime, a.k.a. Young Thug, to make a second attempt to murder YFN Lucci. Right. Uh, while Lucci was locked up in Fulton County Jail. That might be the most interesting thing I saw in this indictment, other than the details around how Donovan Thomas was killed. So you have to ask yourself, how did the police know that that conversation took place? Like, there are only a few ways that they would know. One would be if one of those people is turning state's evidence and told them. But the more likely thing is they had a phone that was smuggled in and they made a phone call or had a phone call made to them and that phone call was intercepted. And I've got to ask how that happened. Um, Is it possible that the Fulton County uh, Jail, that the Fulton County Sheriff's Office has what's called a stingray that is sitting on top of the cell phone towers, intercepting all of the traffic that's going through those cell phone towers, picking out the calls they like and recording them? Or did they have a specific wiretap on the phone that some inmate illegally had while they were in the jail? And if they had that phone tapped, 
how the heck did they not know? Why would they not suspect? They being Christian Eppinger and everybody else on that call. Why would they think that they were safe having that phone call? Like, oh, we got a smuggled phone. Like, we're good. Like, the idea that you're not thinking that the world is watching you right now. Um, and that's a pervasive thing throughout the indictment. It's clear that they were being observed and they either didn't know or they didn't care or they weren't attentive to it. And it's shocking. Like it's one of a couple of things that are shocking. The sorts of things that people put on Instagram are shocking. If you are engaged in a criminal conspiracy and you're putting pictures of yourself with an illegal weapon or throwing gang signs or all the rest of this stuff, like, the idea that that's not going to get picked up by the cops at some point is mind-blowing to me. Well, I mean, the person we just mentioned, uh, Christian Eppinger, who's actually a rapper under the name of Big Briss, uh, he was actually charged with shooting a cop six times. He very much was. And I'm uh, like, I saw the video. Uh, a police officer... Uh, was going to make the arrest on an outstanding warrant for an, uh, uh, an armed robbery. Um, that picture pushes him away, draws, and basically shoots this guy once in the head and then five times in the chest, like no farther away than I am from that camera. Um, the fact that that officer survived is shocking. Like it's surprising. Um, and, and Epinger was captured not too long later. Um, Epinger's arrest, I think, was what set off the rest of this. I think the the district attorney says that they were looking at things before then, and they were, but they weren't getting ready to act. Like Epinger's arrest set off the chain that ultimately ended up with Young Thug being arrested. Right, because wasn't he granted bond after shooting that cop? No, he wasn't. Like there was talk about giving him a bond, and it's because the Fulton County jail system is over full. Um, so there's a rolling day, the 90 day calendar, essentially, if you are not charged, like formally indicted with a crime, um, within 90 days, you are eligible for a bond. Like you could, they can hold you for 90 days for whatever. If you're, if the, if the underlying charge is strong enough, but you have to actually be indicted. Epinger was bumping up against the 90 days and a judge not be believing that they weren't going to be able to look at them again before 90 days came up, granted them a, like a sky high $300,000 bond. That was immediately quashed. Um, Eppinger was never going to get out on bond, but on paper, he had a $300,000 bond for like two hours. Um, but yeah, everybody, a huge call to action. Like all of the police and the district attorney held a press conference and no, 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 we're not going to let this guy out on bond. Why was this judge doing this? And uh, it was kind of a dog and pony show about it. But um, yeah, he wasn't going anywhere. He is going to be spending the rest of his life in jail because a, a judge subsequent, he was on parole, essentially, for a crime where he could have been sentenced for 20 or 30 or 40 years. He was resentenced to the crime that he was already committed, that he had sentenced for, for, I want to say, 40 years. Um, Epinger will never be a free man again. Right, because after that whole shooting, he faced 15 new charges, including attempted murder. He hasn't so. even been convicted or charged with any of that stuff yet. He's in jail for the rest of his life, and he hasn't been charged. He hasn't been convicted of any of that yet. Okay, so then April of 2022 rolls around. Uh, young Thug's uh, child's mother, Lakavia Jackson, ends up getting killed in a bowling alley in Atlanta. Well, outside of a bowling alley in Atlanta. People, people, were, people were assuming this is just a random shooting, just two people arguing over a bowling ball, but you feel there's more to it. Well, that's the thing. At least I did it first. Let me just say one um, it appears that I was wrong, and I have some apologies to make for that. Uh, you know, I, I want to apologize to the, the family of Jeffrey Williams for being for for making that error. It was an error. There was no malice there. I was looking at the statistical probability of somebody being killed at random who also just happened to be involved with 
like tangentially all of this other stuff that had been going on. I would, I've spent the last year of my life looking at seven years of back and forth between YFN and YSL where their family members were being targeted and were involved. And then I saw Lakivia Jackson's murder, like knowing that this indictment was coming and thinking this has got to be connected. Um, the police and the district attorney and the family all insist that there is no connection. I made a statistical inference based on all of the other crimes that are going on. But it doesn't, it actually looks like a random act of violence. And that speaks to how much violence is actually occurring on the street in Atlanta and why the district attorney is all hot to arrest gang members any way she can right now. Give me a second, I really want to explain the gang law. Like, Georgia's gang law is unique. It's different from other states. It's not federal, this is state law. But it's very different. In Georgia, in order to prove a gang case, like a, under the Gang Terrorism Act, there are three legal, like, pillars to the stool. You have to prove that the gang is a criminal gang, that it's not just a group of people, but it's a group of people who are committing crimes together, like that they are an, a criminal enterprise. Like Then you have to prove that any given individual is a member of that gang, like that they're not just affiliated per se, but they're actually like a member of the gang. And then you have to prove that a crime that they committed wasn't just a regular crime, but a, a gang crime, a crime that was done because they were in the gang in order to further the interests of the gang. Like, if you get all three of those things, then you've got a Gang Terrorism Act violation, and it's five to 15 years on top of whatever, like, the, the underlying crime is. And that underlying crime could be jaywalking. It doesn't matter. The the key thing is these prosecutions allow the, the, the prosecutor to introduce all kinds of evidence that would never see the inside of a courtroom about like Instagram posts that are showing you wearing colors and throwing gang signs and holding guns and music lyrics that are upholding the gang ethos and are showing what the gang signs are and talking about gang life and specific murders and specific acts of violence or specific crimes. Um, the uh, None of this stuff would ever see the inside of a courtroom anywhere else. Georgia's different. Like, and it's a law that was written and then rewritten in 2016. Uh, it's been tested in the court a couple of times and upheld. Uh, this is probably the most extensive use of it I've ever seen. Like, this is a test. And it's a test Fannie Willis has brought in the state's experts in. Like, she hired the guy who wrote the law to run her gang prosecutions. Um, and it's not just... It's not just for the gangs, the street gangs that we're talking about. The racketeering element, which is different, that's how Donald Trump is going to be charged. Like, some of this is a test for that case. Like, do they have the internal processes necessary in order to prove this sort of organized crime stuff? Um, fascinating stuff. Okay. And then... May 9th, 2022. That's when everyone gets arrested. Now, before I get into that, uh, you and I have had some conversations uh, over the phone. And from what you told me, Young Thug was probably aware that this arrest and raid was actually coming. I think so. Uh, and I say that for a few reasons. And not just because I've got a big head and I've been writing about it. And of course he was reading my stuff. He was probably not reading my stuff. Uh, but his father was. Uh, Jeffrey Williams Sr. Uh, told me four days ago in a clubhouse chat room that he was upset with me because of the Lakivia Jackson stuff. But he also said that he was aware of the, of the, the fact that I'd been writing that this indictment was coming down. And never mind Jeffrey Williams' dad. Like, 
His attorney had to know this was coming based on all of the other stuff that was going on. And especially when they ended up uh, canceling a, uh, a concert that was scheduled for April 15th at State Farm Arena in downtown Atlanta. Huge concert, like Young Thug and Friends, like gonna be a blowout. Um, and then at the last minute, well, two days before, uh, they canceled that concert. Um, there's every indication to me that Young Thug was aware that there was legal trouble brewing, that the cops were looking at him. And so it is, again, mind-blowing to me that they could have found anything that was illegal in his house. The idea that the cops came and that he had like 20 bottles of promethazine syrup and a bunch of like THC drink from a like marketing firm in North Carolina um, and a bunch of guns, including, including a switch, including a, a Glock that had been modified to fire as a fully automatic weapon. The idea that his attorney would not have been dragging a wheelbarrow full of stuff out of his house like, <laughs> is shocking. And uh, it makes me wonder what his state of mind was. Like, quite literally, I don't know what was going through Young Thug's head leading up to this. I'm worried that, frankly, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't lucid. Um, I'm not making an accusation there. I'm trying to explain how this could have ha possibly happened. Right. Because like I said, on May 9th, 2022, uh, Young Thug Gunner uh, Yak Gotti was among 28 people that were associated with YSL. They were charged with a 56 count RICO uh, indictment in state court. Um, like you said, Young Thug's home was raided and they found a bunch of stuff which caused seven additional felonies. And the switch by itself is like 10 years, right? Up to 10 years. It depends uh, on the like circumstances. But yeah. Well, initially, Gunner wasn't actually part of this first wave of arrests, but there was a warrant out for his arrest. So after a couple of days, he turned himself in. Right. He, uh, I mean, they would have arrested him on like that Monday if they knew where he was. Like, and I imagine he got, he had enough sense to get his, his affairs in order so that they wouldn't catch him with 20 bottles of lean. Uh, it's part of the reason why I think he's uh, likely to survive this in ways that the others are not. Well, uh, Yak Gotti uh, was also one of the people arrested. And, uh, you know, a while back, maybe about a, a year before, Yak Gotti actually uh, posted an Instagram picture of himself standing, standing. on wife and Lucci's uh, Maybach. Yeah, out uh, at uh, Lennox Mall, which is just all sorts of ironic. The, uh, right. They're beefing believe, at the mall. I mean, yeah. really? Like, this is where we are. Like, I feel like it's 1988 again, but there it is. Yeah, uh, I believe he actually used that picture on his mixtape cover. Uh, he did. He did. He yeah. very much did. Right. I remember I interviewed YFN Lucha. I asked him about that. I think he called him a hoe for doing that, but... You know, it didn't really go beyond that. Yeah. Uh, but now, but now that picture, that Instagram photo, as well as the mixtape cover, is now part of the indictment. Right, because so Yak Gotti is portrayed in the indictment as a as a trigger puller, like as a guy who's charged with murder. And if he's standing on what on wife and Lucci's Maybach, it shows this connection between Yak Gotti and the gang war, like it's a direct provocation, like that would have could have led to additional violence. Right. And like we had said in the very beginning, uh, Yak Gotti is one of the people accused of killing the- Donovan Thomas. The, uh, Donovan Thomas, a.k.a. Nut. Uh, so it really ties in various ways, at least according to the indictment. I was surprised to see that it was him, frankly. I was super surprised to see it was him. I didn't, like, he wasn't on my radar. Like, I knew he was out there, but I had no idea that he was- like, I really want to see the evidence. Like, I want to know how the police know that there were four people in that car and that those were the four. Like, the police have spoken at length, uh, at length in previous cases about their, their belief that Shannon Jackson, Shannon Stilwell in this indictment, was the one of the people who was engaged in the drive-by. Like, 
I'd been looking for Shannon Jackson's name for a year. Kendrick? What? Um, like, just this whole thing has been very surprising. Well, uh, you know, Fonnie Willis, the, the DA, uh, actually spoke in, in a public meeting where she said the gangs were the number one threat against public safety. Uh, she feels that gangs are committing conservatively 75 to 80 percent of all the violent crimes in Atlanta uh, that they're actually seeing out there and they have to be booted from the community. And she she said that you should absolutely expect more RICO indictments against other street gangs. Yeah. I heard from her office today that I should expect another RICO indictment of another street gang in Atlanta sued. Um, like it's going to be the hits are just going to keep coming. Like it's going to be every month or two until she thinks she's done. And I don't know which one's next. Um, the, uh, I think that saying that 75 or 80% of the violence in Atlanta is retributive to gangs is what a prosecutor would say. Um, I think she's overstating it. But I do think that a substantial number of the violent crimes in Atlanta are gang-related. Like, we're going to argue about the number but it ain't zero, and it's a lot. Um, it's why I'm writing about this. I am not a music journalist. Um, I like hip hop. I, you know, but I'm very like Wu Tang Clan era, if you get me. Um, I'm a political journalist. Like I've been looking at all of this through the lens of how all of this affects public policy around criminal justice in Georgia. Because a year or so ago, it became really clear to me that as crime was spiking, like there was going to be this public backlash against crime, that politicians were going to use this as an excuse to crack down and frankly, crack down on the black community in Atlanta in ways that are ugly. Uh, and it's happened. Um, the governor has a, um, a crime reduction unit in the state p patrol. That has stopped 20,000 cars over the last 18 months. They've arrested maybe 250 people on outstanding warrants, give or take. Like 27 murder warrants, like hooray, except 20,000 stops. It's not fundamentally different than stop and frisk in New York. Um, I worry that folks like... Funny Willis or others will look at the rising crime rate as an excuse to just... And so I said, I'm going to explain what's going on. I'm going to put it in ways that anybody can understand. I'm going to explain why the violence is happening. I'm going to show the ways that you can get at it that don't involve, you know, stop and frisk, frisk nonsense. Like, And it's why I've been following the YSL case. Um, because a lot of this violence apparently connects to this crazy gang war between YSL and YFN. Um, it's not, it's not incidental. Like, let me give you a statistical example. Like, over the last five months in Atlanta, the aggravated assault rate, that's the number of shootings in Atlanta, has not increased year over year. It's about flat. The number of murders is up 60%. Now, there are only so many ways that happens. People don't suddenly become more capable of committing a murder when they shoot someone. Like, your own, like people do not randomly become better shots. It means that that extra 60%, that's intentional. That means somebody's trying to kill someone else. They're not just shooting at them. Like, and when I see that, I go, well, who's trying to kill people? Like, that's gang stuff. Um, a lot of that is gang stuff. Um, and it's why they're taking this thing seriously. It's why they threw the book at a bunch of people. It's why they're going to throw the book at the next bunch of people and the next bunch of people. Well, I think the big surprise for everyone was that after Young Thug and then Gunna uh, get arrested and turn themselves in, uh, no one gets bond. Was that, a, was that a surprise to you at all? Especially Gunna, who really doesn't have any violent crime associated with him. He doesn't get Bond either. Uh, I think some of this is flight risk issues. I think some of this is just the number of guns 
that have been found. I think some of that reflects the political realities right now. Look at what happened when Christian Eppinger looked like he might, for a fleeting instant, get bond. Like the entire edifice of public safety in Atlanta just descended on the courthouse to say no. And that judge got lit up, and unfairly, I think. Like, she didn't actually do anything wrong. Um, she was following the law as she understood it. But if this is the reaction to that guy getting bond, no, no other judge is likely to take a risk on it, especially if they think that that person who gets out on bond is going to end up either getting killed or killing someone else. Like, nobody wants to risk their political career on that right now. Uh, well, according to the DA, they're saying that, you know, Young Thug and YSL triggered over 50 murders and incidents of, of gun violence. Again. Uh, I mean, her exact quote is, uh, Thomas's murder, uh, which we talked about in the beginning, Nut, is extremely significant. It occurred, it occurred back in 2015. And what myself and any law enforcement member could tell you as a result of the back and forth gun violence and murders that have occurred have probably been in access of 50 since 2015. Uh, triggered by the back and forth between the YSL and other gangs. I think 50 is a big number. I'm skeptical of the number, but I'm sort of adding it up in my head, and it's possible. 2015 to 2022, that's an average of seven murders a year. Yeah, that's entirely possible. Like, I mean, there have been three, four five, maybe six in the last five months that I would attribute to this gang war, like that I know of, um, five or six. Well, uh, Young Thug's attorney, Brian Steele, uh, claimed that his client is innocent. He said, I'll tell you to, you know, I'll tell you the response to any allegation. Mr. Williams committed no crimes whatsoever, and we will fight to my last drop of blood to clear his name. Uh, Metro Boomin, uh, one of the big producers uh, in Atlanta, said YSL is not a gang and has never been full. Uh, YSL is a, is a registered LLC and has provided countless jobs opportunities for underprivileged black people and really just all people because that's how big Thug's heart is. Uh, Lil Keed, uh, who is part of YSL as well, the record label side, uh, who was not actually uh, indicted or arrested, uh, he said, why sell is a family? It's not a gang and so forth. But then a few days later, at age 24, he dies, allegedly of organ failure. Yeah. That's hard. Yeah, th th that's a rough one. I mean, the rumor is that it was a drug overdose because a 24-year-old dying from organ failure really just doesn't sound right. So uh, you know? the initial autopsy didn't turn up anything. Um, like I have the initial autopsy report on my phone right now. Um, he, uh, died in Los Angeles. His brother drove him, little got it, uh, drove him to the hospital. Um, they're doing a toxicology report. Those things take six weeks to come back. So we won't know for another month and a half exactly why. Um, based on what I know about Lil Key, like this music label and this music was his whole life. And it was the thing that was dragging him out of poverty. Lil Keed moved to Cleveland Avenue when he was a kid. Um, he has no criminal record I could find. He had some weird financial issues uh, as late as like 2021. Uh, like he wasn't, like he was in a dispute over rent with his, his landlord. Like, and that could have been just, hey, why are the pipes broken? I'm not paying you till you fix it sort of thing. I don't know more than that. What I do know is like his financial life was tied to YSL. Like and YSL was turning him into a, a star with a legitimate music career. Um, and all of a sudden it's blown up uh, for reasons having nothing to do with him. Um, it is hard for me to contemplate that despair. Uh, and like my, I have tremendous sympathy for his family. Do you think that he was actually going to be charged with something and he heard about it and the stress no, of that? I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so.
Like, there's nothing. Like, Rakid Render was clean. Like, at least as far as I could see. Like, there's nothing in the court documents. There's nothing in his civil filings. There's no complaints. There's nothing in 911 records. Like, I can't find anything. Like, he was just a kid. It was a rapper. Like, it's awful. Yeah, sad. Sad. Uh, well, Young Thug's lawyer uh, filed a motion uh, to the court saying that Young Thug was held in dungeon-like conditions, uh, that he had no windows, no human contact, and so forth. And uh, the police actually responded and said, this is a detention center, not the Ritz-Carlton. Yeah. I saw a picture of the place. He is in the same damn cell as every other person in Cobb County. Like, they actually moved him to Cobb County for fairly obvious reasons. Do you want YFN Lucci and, and Young Thug in the same jail? I don't think so. Um, but he's in, the, he's in a bog standard holding cell at Cobb County. Like, there's no, like, there are no frills in Cobb County. Like, it's a jail cell. Like, if if he's entitled to better, everybody else in that jail is. Now, I can argue everybody else in that jail probably is. But. Yeah. But it's not like he's being held in some sort of special. I asked. You know, horrible room that, you know, that they're putting him there on purpose. Yeah, it's well, just, no, I don't standard. think he is. Um, I asked the jail whether, because his, the descriptions, the initial descriptions sounded an awful lot like a suicide watch. Um, the, uh, but the jail tells me that he is not on suicide watch, like that that's just how they do it. Like if he was on suicide watch, he'd be in a different cell, like basically next to medical facilities and somebody would be checking on him every 15 minutes. And that's not what's happening. He's just being kept away from everybody else. And I think that might just be a safety thing. Like with wife and Lucci, wife and Lucci's Court filings say that he believes that there's a bounty on his head. And after the attempt on his life and this thing in the indictment where, like, two guys are basically saying, can I kill him? Like, he has reason to believe that. I would think Young Thug is facing the same kind of danger from YSL guys in jail. So I can imagine the jail why, folks. Why, why, why offend? Why offend, sorry. Like, that Lucci, that Thug is facing the same kind of uh, peril. Uh, from YFN folks as YFN Lucci is from YSL folks. And so I can imagine the jail going, how do I keep this guy alive? Because if he does get shanked in jail, he is going to get a bond. And they don't want that. Okay, but YFN Lucci got stabbed in jail and still didn't get a bond. Yeah, I think he might at some point. Like, I think he might. Um, the uh, Especially if there's another attempt. Like this... Like if he, if, if they can argue that he's not safe, what are you going to do? Right. And recently YFN Lucci, uh, was lawyer actually made a statement saying that there is no plea deal on the table and that Lucci's heading to trial. Yeah. Why was there no plea deal? Uh, I think it's because the, again, like the, the district attorney is trying to get the top people. And I'm going to argue this for a second, but Lucci looks like he's one of the two. There's another fellow. Um, I'm sorry. It'll come to me. Uh, there's an, like, Lucci looks like he's the top of the chain, like in terms of y, YFN in Atlanta. And so they don't want to let the big guys off while frying the little ones. Um, like they would rather let, the little guys go while they capture the big fish. Um, and it's exactly why I think Thug is not going to get a deal either. But here's the thing. Like, and it's the, it's the next step in the ladder for me as a journalist, as I'm looking at all of this. Uh, we're placing a lot of blame on guys like y, YF and Lucci and, YS and, and Young Thug for a violent crime in Atlanta. But these guys are being facilitated by major labels. Like, Young Thug, YSL's label, 
is an imprint of 300 Entertainment, which is owned by Warner Music Group. Warner Music Group is owned by a fellow named Leo Blavatnik. Uh, he's an American by way of Soviet Russia. Uh, he is a Trump ally. He gave Trump a million dollars for his inaugural campaign, uh, his inaugural thing, which was basically just give me money. Um, he's aligned with Vladimir Putin. Um, he has helped other oligarchs uh, shed their financial uh, problems, essentially, because of sanctions in the past. That's who owns Warner. And I'm looking at the top guy and how his music empire is profiting from all of this murder and blood and death in the streets of Atlanta. And I'm wondering at what point someone at the top, the real top, starts to accrue liability. I'm not saying necessarily that guy needs to go to jail. I'm saying where's the civil lawsuit that says Warner, Bro Warner Music uh, was deliberately cultivating violence for commercial purposes? Well, I remember uh, one of my regular guests, Boosie, uh, who actually beat a murder charge himself uh, and had his lyrics played in court and everything else like that. We talked about all these various RICO charges, and he's calling them rapper RICO. Because, you know, from the top down, if you look at it, like, these guys are really successful entertainers. They are in the studio recording music. They are always on tour. They're doing shows. They're, they're doing features. Uh, they're filming music videos. I mean, is it really realistic that they're also, you know, running these big street gangs? Or is it that, you know, they grew up in a certain area, they know certain people that might be engaging in this, and maybe they just got caught up by affiliation? It's, I mean, it's a good question. So... One of the things that I'm seeing in Atlanta is how, let me back up. 75,000 people a year move to Metro Atlanta. Maybe nine or 10,000 of them are black and young. And half of them are looking for a way to get into the music and movie and entertainment business here because we are black, the black Mecca. We're the new Hollywood. Like, you want to get your rap career on, you come to Atlanta. Like, and I know there are people in Chicago and New York and LA who are screaming when I say that, but there it is. Um, only if you're just a kid who's 18 and maybe you can rap and maybe you can't, but there are a hundred other people out there you're competing with. If you're looking for a way to get an edge and then a street gang that has a connection to mu music studios and label executives says, all right, hey, look, yeah, we'll take you. Just, but you got to be down with the system. Like, let's punch you in, go do a crime so that we know that you're good. Like, the music becomes a recruiting tool. Like, and that's the thing that I'm worried about, um, that it isn't incidental, that like the music labels are deliberately looking for people who are engaged in acts of violence because those acts of violence, this drill music is authentic, that it's street real and that that creates an audience. Like there's an audience for people who are looking for real rappers who are doing real stuff and the labels, because the music industry is all screwed up right now like because of streaming and you don't necessarily need to be on a label in order to get your music out there. And so there are a hundred different ways that people are trying to, the traditional revenue model for music has been breaking down. It's hard to make money making music. Like, but drill sells, like it's not an accident that this stuff is all at the top of the charts right now. Like there's a financial incentive for these label executives to be looking for somebody who's got a record and looks like he's still shooting people. Okay. So at this point, everyone's locked up. Did anyone from YSL uh, get bond? I don't think so. So uh, all if it's, 28 like people. They're still rolling through this. So I can't say that that's going to be true forever. Um, but I haven't heard about anybody getting bond yet. Okay, so now you have 28 people locked up. No one's getting bond. Um, 
And this is not a federal RICO case. It's a state RICO case. It is a state RICO case. Is there any difference between the two? Because you always hear how the feds have a 98% conviction rate, especially with their RICO cases, and no one ever gets off. You either plead out or you end up doing 100 years. I mean, is there any difference when it comes to a state RICO case? So the Georgia's RICO law is modeled almost word for word on the federal RICO law. So from a legal perspective, there isn't a lot of difference. Uh, But the amount of resources that the state, that the county prosecutor can bring to bear on a RICO case that's at the state level is much lower than the kind of resources that the federal government could bring to bear. Um, the conviction rates are still sky high. They're still super high. Um, they are not as high as they are for a federal case. Okay. So, but you have a situation here where at least two of the guys, uh, Young Thug and Gunner are all multimillionaires. They will buy whatever type of legal aid they need to in order to get themselves out of the situation. They'll empty their entire bank account. They'll spend $10 million on on their... So here's the problem. Like, yeah. So Young Thug has got Brian Steele. And it's funny because Wife and Lucci's got Drew Finling. And Drew Finling and Brian Steele, like, together are like Saul Goodman. Like they are like for real, those are the two guys. Like, but they have to represent their own clients. They can't represent the other people. Like the best lawyers, like, and it's not just them, there are a couple of other cases that are involved. The best lawyers are already snapped up in in Atlanta. Like, those folks, like number 21 on that indictment, they get the B team. Like, even if they're if it's a private attorney. So the question here is, like, Young Thug can't just pay for his own attorney. He has to pay for 26 other defenses, all of which have to be fairly robust, all of which also have to be completely unconnected to his own. Otherwise, that conflict of interest is going to come up and, like, they'll be spooned out. Um, I don't don't think those guys are going to... Like I, it, and again, it's one of these things where I'm wondering if the label steps in and provides a defense, an independent defense to each of them. And even then you start raising the question about whether or not the label by doing that is starting to accrue liability to itself. Like those, there are a bunch of people there in a really tough spot. Is there any chance at all of Young Thug walking away from this and just getting probation? So there's, you never want to say never. I never, ever want to say never. Um, And I am not a lawyer. I'm just a guy who's been covering crime for a long time. There are things that could go right for him. Uh, Like at the top of the list would be an act of prosecutorial misconduct. And I don't know what that might be. But the sort of thing where the district attorney is screwed up in a way that's so hard that they've got to throw the case out. And if that's happening, Brian Steele would be the guy who could find that if it's happening. Unlikely. Very unlikely, especially given who's, in, who's, who's been involved in the prosecution. We're talking about one of the most veteran prosecutors in the country. Um, possibly some of the evidence gets thrown out for one reason or another. The, like a judge goes, oh, yeah, these lyrics, this is this is prejudicial. Get this out of here. Oh, like you missed a warrant over here. Now get that out of here. Oh, this gun, like, uh, well, okay, like for something, I don't know, like for whatever reason, like enough evidence goes away where it becomes clear that they're not going to be able to prove like the racketeering and the gang charge, at which point you fall back on the other stuff. Like, can you prove that you were, uh, you know, in a conspiracy to commit a murder? And that's harder if nobody flips. Um 28 defendants. I'm betting somebody flips. Like, and that's the key here. Like, I don't see 28 people going down for the rest of their life for this sort of thing. One or more of them are going to turn evidence. They're going to explain the inner workings of this. And they'll get deals so that the prosecutors can get young thug. And I think this is young thug and everybody else is secondary. Right. I mean, because it seems like a lot of the case is stemming from the murder that happened in 2015. Right. 
Uh, he's where, the guy who called it, according to the indictment. Well, I mean, he rented the car, yeah. the, the Infinity. Uh, but then again, it's not like he was in the car doing the shooting. He just rented a car. Right. So he could have been like, hey, my right. friend yeah, well, my friend him. is broke. Yeah, my friend is broke. He needs a car. All right, cool. Here's a car. I don't know what the hell you're doing with that car. You go and kill somebody? Like, what the hell do I got to do with that? I just rented a car. That's exactly what Brian Steele is going to argue. And this is why I'm waiting for the rest of this evidence to start to emerge. How did they know that that was the car? Like, how did they know that Young Thug rented it? Like, I mean, obviously, they have a reason for saying so. But once they do, they'll start to reveal some of their other sources and the other information they've got. And suddenly, a lot of stuff that's been completely invisible to us is going to come out. And, we, and then we'll have to reevaluate. Right. Because the DA said that she promised uh, Donovan Thomas's mother that she would do everything she could to make sure that her son had justice. That's a big deal. And, right. And but. I, I guess that whole situation, I mean, wasn't the son also a gang leader, allegedly himself? Yep. So it's like you're going really hard to get justice for someone that was probably doing kind of the same thing on their end. So what what is really the motivation of putting that out there? It, it, it's, it's a little bit confusing on my end. I think the key thing here is that a murder is a murder is a murder. Like, and it doesn't matter necessarily if the person who's murdered is good or bad. Like... I feel exactly the same way for a gang member. Like somebody who may actually have a uh, history of violence. Like when you, somebody is murdered, it creates a hole in a community. It steals redemption away. Who is to say that Tom, Donovan Thomas today would not be a leader in the fight against gang violence? Like, we'll never know because that moment was stolen from him because he was murdered. Like, I think as a matter of principle, you have to you have to treat every single death identically, whether that person is white or black, rich or poor, a criminal or a saint. And I think that that's where the, the prosecutor is coming from. From your point of view, do you think that Gunna could potentially walk away from this? Yeah. I do. I don't know if you walk away is a strong word. I mean, I think he's likely to plea out and be convicted of something. Um, he'll be a felon uh, if he pleads guilty. Um, the question is whether or not he does actual jail time and how much. Um, because if somebody gets like five, at Gunner's age, if he gets five years and gets out, he's got a, a life and a career in front of him. Like he could go back into music uh, he'll probably still have some money, maybe. I question whether or not any of these guys actually get out of this with their wallets intact. But he'll still have enough star power, I suspect, to be able to do another album and make more money. Um, the, uh, But it's not clear. Like, I don't know. Um, he's charged with serious crimes. Like, the drug trafficking crime is a serious crime. Like, that's likely five or 10 years on the face of it. Right. But was he actually drug trafficking or was he just using? And know. he just had a lot of it because he's got money. You know what I'm saying? Was, was Gunna out there selling, you know, selling lean or was he just drinking lean? That's a, no, It's a good question. It's a good question. Um, and any competent defense attorney is going to, that's exactly how they're going to present it. Like that he wasn't a drug dealer. He was just, uh, he had the Costco supply thing going on for his stash, you know, and it might just be that simple. Like, and that would be an argument, especially if you're trying to plea out. Like, I don't think he wants to go to trial because if, if he goes to trial, it's not just the evidence of the drug stuff. It's all the other gang stuff. And he's got to sit in front of that same jury who's going to hear all of this other gang stuff that is going to look super criminal. Like a jury that was just hearing the drug stuff might go, eh. But if the jury is hearing this drug stuff and, oh, like you guns and, oh, this guy had a switch and, oh, this guy was in this rap war that was murdering people with this other stuff and you're connected to this, they'll, they'll convict him just out of like an abundance of caution. Like even though that's not the law, 
That's what a jury will do. Well, and then you also have the aspect of these guys wanting careers once they get out and the whole snitching thing in hip hop. You know, for example, when a bunch of Wall Street guys get arrested, everyone just tells on each other and that's just how it is and everyone accepts it. But in hip hop, you know, yes, Takashi came out and he had somewhat of a career, but everyone calls him a snitch and a rat and everything else like sure, that. Sure, but they're still um, listening to his music. They're still listening to his music. It'd be inter- interesting to see because, you know, with these 28 people indicted, how many of them are rappers? I mean, uh, Young Thug, Gunna, uh, Yak Gotti are the three biggest ones, but then a bunch of other ones are also Lil rappers Duke, with smaller names. Slime Life Shoddy. Yeah. Lil Duke, uh, yeah. Like a couple of, look, Christopher Epinger is a rapper like I'm a rapper. Like, he had, like, two videos on YouTube, and that's it, and whatever. Like, some of these guys were wannabes. Like, some of them were wannabes with, you know, chops. Hard to say. Like, did they want a career? They absolutely wanted a career. That's why they were there. Like, that's, you know, it's hard to say. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see what happens, because... If you do cooperate and end up getting a minimum amount of time, you got to come out. And then obviously everyone you cooperate against, they're going to do their best to try to push, you know, to the public that, hey, this guy cooperated against me. And that's why I got all this time and so forth. And I, I mean, it's it's got a lot of dimensions to it, um, you know, and then once they actually go and do the prison time, how safe are they going to be after they cooperated? Yeah. You know, is there going to be a level of, of retaliation and revenge and, and so forth? Um well, that's it's kind of why people are getting prosecuted in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this whole thing is a mess, honestly. Uh, it is. And what's interesting it is also that gets you worse, would, by the way, it's going to get worse. I think so. Yeah. Um, like I said, there are other prosecutions coming. Like they're going to be chalk a block every month or two, probably for years until the murder rate starts to fall. And so if you're if you're an affiliated rapper in Atlanta, like your life is tense or it's going to be. Like, and there's all this sort of internet chatter right now about which rapper is going to be next. Is it gonna be Playboy Cardi or 21 Savage or Lil Baby or Future or whatnot? Like, and future aside, I don't actually have a whole lot of, I'm not looking at him, but um a lot of these other guys. Like they're name checking, real world, murdering, armed robbery committing, street gangs in Atlanta, in their music, they're claiming, um, and every time they do, it becomes a lot easier for a prosecutor to use the music, and use the label, to wrap the whole bunch of them up, um, like that creates a kind of tension. And I don't know whether or not that tension, you know, I don't know whether or not that turns the heat up or down on the street. Like, I don't know whether or not we're going to have more shootings. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you look at the history of hip hop, uh, I mean, gangs and so forth have always been part of, of hip hop culture in one way or another. But it wasn't until DJ Quick actually put out what specific blood gang he's in in his music for the first time, and this was like early 90s. And then that set off a chain of events where everyone started claiming their gang in their music. Yeah, And ultimately, this is a move that's now biting everyone. I mean, it's continued to bite everyone, but now it's really biting everyone because, you know, I didn't even mention a lot of the stuff going through the indictment, like this lyric here where he says, I'm a slime, I'm a blood, boom, that's part of the indictment. You claiming YSL in a song will put you in the indictment. You claiming, you know, any sort of gang-related, shooting-related, anything, no matter if it's got anything to do with nothing, it's all ending up in this paperwork. And, you know, and I remember interviewing Boosie, who was up on a murder charge as well. He said that they spent a day and a half in the courtroom playing his songs to the jury. And I think that's going to happen again if this stuff actually goes to trial. Very much. Promise you it will happen. I promise you it will happen. They're gonna, it's gonna be like uh it's gonna be like a history channel thing. Like, here's a history of YSL rap. You know, and it's 
Uh, it's got to be a documentary, um, a seminar. Uh, you know, and I expect that. Like, there's this whole thing about drill that I'm starting to, like, I'm, I'm learning a lot, by the way. Like, I'm a 49-year-old, you know, guy. Like, a lot of this stuff is, is new to me. Um, but drill is just fundamentally different from like the earlier phases of hip hop. And I'm not sure it's a good thing in Atlanta. Like we got infected by Chicago and Detroit. Um, and I think that was part of what happened in the pandemic. Although a lot of this predates the pandemic, don't get me wrong. But we had an infusion of Chicago rap come into Atlanta during the pandemic. And part of that was because Atlanta kept its clubs open. Like our governor, like three months in said, nope, like restaurants and bars, you're going to stay open. Like to heck with this, like the economy. Ah! And yeah, we ended up with people from all over the East coast coming to Atlanta to party and it turned up the heat. Like I, you know, I, I, I don't want to blame Chicago. Like, cause frankly, they've got their own problems, but um, this drill stuff is not healthy. I don't think it's healthy for rap. Like speaking as, as an old head, like, like I interviewed KRS one 20 years ago, guy, like that's where I am. Um, the, uh, the idea that people are tying murder, like claiming bodies as closely as they are in songs, like, you have to expect this kind of legal backlash. Like this isn't, this isn't something that should be considered unexpected. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting is that you had actually contacted us on April 11th, which is almost exactly one month before all these arrests were happening. Yep. And you said, Hey, this I've been investigating this whole thing and something really big is about to happen. And, uh, you know, we, we had spoken to you and everything, but we had no idea how big it actually was. And then after all the arrests came, you hit us up again and said, this is what I was talking about right here. So, so you actually were not surprised at all. And you actually called it before it happened. I did, but it was visible. Like I'm not some prophet here. And it's not like I've got cops whispering in my ears. Like most of the time I, I've been thrown out of more police stations. That's not a joke. Like I've been thrown out of police stations around here. Um, the, uh, but you just, you read the paperwork. Like you read the, like I am researching a book on violent crime in Atlanta. And so I look through all the initial incident reports and all of the, you know, charges and the indictments and the trial transcripts. And when I keep seeing YSLs showing up over and over again, while the district attorney is saying, yeah, we're going to indict some gangs, it's not hard to put one and one together there. Like the mystery here. And by the way, I think you do an excellent job. Like, I'm here for a reason. I think you're excellent. Like, Thank you. watch Vlad TV. But a lot of the music journalism world is garbage. Like, they're just bad at it. They're not doing their job. They're not trying to dig. They're not trying to understand. They're trying to promote. Like, it's bad journalism. Like, and I'm at war with it. <laughs> well, George, I appreciate you coming in and giving insight into this whole thing. Uh, I think you have a bigger understanding about this case than just about anybody, just because of how much time and effort you really put into it over this past year. And, and you also live in the community and get to see a lot of this stuff, you know, the effects of this stuff firsthand. Uh, so I definitely appreciate you uh, sharing and, you know, we want to continue to stay in touch with you, you know, as this thing develops, you know, to really get your perspective on how things are. And, you know, look, at the end of the day, uh, I'm fans of a lot of this, these guys' music. You know, I listen to Young Thug. I listen to Gunna. Um, I've never actually met them myself. We've never interviewed them ourselves. You know, we always get blamed. Well, whoever does a Vlad TV interview gets indicted. We've never interviewed these guys. So <laughs> we're, we're stepping out of, out of this particular one. But, you know, I'm hoping that it ultimately works out. And I'm hoping these guys could go and go back to their families. I know Thug got a bunch of kids. Uh, I'm not sure if Gunna does, but 
a lot of people do depend on him financially and they do have millions and millions of fans. Uh, but, you know, this also sets a very cautionary tale to everyone out there who is trying to get their music career going by putting their own crimes out there. I've always said, if you're actively a criminal, you should not be doing entertainment. You should not be doing music. You should not be doing interviews. You should not be on social media. You should be a ghost if that's what you're actively doing. But that never really happens. Uh, ultimately, people have seen, uh, you know, taking their street affiliations and churning it into successful movie career, you know, uh, music careers. They look at the Jay-Z's of the world. Uh, they look at, um, you know, like who else? Uh, you know, the futures of the world who have done stuff in the past and have used that to actually blow themselves up and think, okay, I'm going to do the same thing. But the difference is, is they're still doing it when these guys, it's, you know, way in the past. And it's yeah. past the statute of limitations. So, like I said, I hope it works out. And, uh, you know, I appreciate you really digging in and doing your job as a journalist, as one journalist to another. Uh, what you've done is exceptional. And, uh, you. you know, I hope you keep doing it. I will. I will. Thank you. You're very welcome. Until next time. Peace. <laughs>